right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Again, has to be careful of the speed. What a comeback season for Hal Sutton. Come right back towards the hole. Seventeen years later, Hal Sutton is the Players' Champion. Well, he's got it going right at the black stick. Be up. Yeah. It is. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Be The Right Club Today podcast. We're really excited about our next guest. He's created quite a stir on the uh, in the golf Twitter world, uh, Mr. Lou Stagner, Golf Stat Pro. He's uh, also a co-host of Hack It Out podcast. Um, if you haven't followed Lou, definitely check him out. He has um, He's always coming up with some very, very interesting stats. We talk a lot about managing expectations on here, and he does a very good job of, of showing some PGA Store stats some pj tour stats to back up how we as golfers need to manage our expectations so lou super excited to have you on welcome to the podcast Uh, thanks for having me guys it's great to be here so lou you know as chase said we uh we do a lot of talking about managing expectations taking inventories of your game knowing what your strengths and your weaknesses are and through all your stats you've uh kind of given us some insight into what the PGA Tour does and the expectations that we should have based on their tour stats. So give us, you know, four, five, six, whatever are the most stats that stand out to you that people should be thinking about. Uh, Boy, there's so many to go through. So uh, I've put so much stuff out there. Let let me try to pick a couple out that will be interesting. And let's uh, go through them maybe one at a time and, and, and talk about them. Uh, I think one of the, uh, the the biggest challenges for amateur players like me is watching professionals on TV. Uh, and generally what we're seeing are the best players in the world playing their best. And so their game is really on. And we sometimes get influenced a little bit by what, by what the announcers say. And, and we, we think that um, the best players in the world are, are better than they actually are. I mean, they're, extremely good, uh, but we think that they they never really miss shots. And so here's a really interesting one. And let's start with a, a Tiger stat. Uh, we only have stats uh, at the shot level on, on Tiger from 2004 and on. We don't have the earlier years, which would be great to look at. I wish we did. But from 2004 through when he you know stopped playing last year, from 100 to 110 yards in the fairway, Uh, he only hit 30% of his shots inside of 10 feet. Um, Now, Tiger's probably the best if, you know, one of the top two or three iron players, if not the top iron player in the history of the game. Um, Maybe you might argue he's not the best wedge player in the history of the game, but he could still obviously play pretty well. And he only hit three out of 10 inside of 10 feet. And you know, I'm an AM player and I play with a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of my friends are anywhere from low single digits to upper teens. Uh, and I can't tell you through the years how many players at my level and uh, think that they should be hitting wedges inside of 15 feet all day. And that's just not the case. It's not the case for, you know, for players on tour, for the best players. And, and it's certainly not going to be the case for a, uh, you know, a 12 or 14 handicap. And, and so that's one of the things that I think we can do a much better job at for amateur players, which is why I put that manage your expectations tweets out so much is to try to help give people better context to help guide their game and, and really manage what is good and what is bad. So how, when you hear that, what are your first thoughts? The, I mean, the, the three out of 10 uh, inside of 10 feet. That, that's not surprising to me at all. You know, I, I mean, there are days that he might have hit all three of them on that one day. And then he might not for 54 holes hit another wedge inside 
10 feet. That's just the facts of the game. You know, it's like you said, Lou, every Sunday afternoon, you're watching the last three groups, the six to nine guys that are playing the very best golf they can play. And they only cut to the really good shots, right? Uh, the, the difference makers. And that's what the public is seeing. And that's not the norm for sure. Well, so if I play devil's advocate a little bit, how would you say the, the, the holes on tour where you have a hundred to 110 yards, whether it's a par five layup or it's a short par four, did you see a pattern with the pins and Lou, you might have some stats on this too, but did you see a pattern with the pins where the pins were tucked in, in tougher spots? And I guess what my question is, is if, is if tiger was playing a Muni where the pins were more in the middle, do you guys think that those, that these numbers would be a little bit better? Is it because of the conditions on tour that, they're not he's not four or five out of ten go ahead Lou you want to take it first uh, oh yeah I mean definitely pins on tour are significantly more tucked than you're going to find at any golf course on any day they're typically playing five from the edge or less um, for most of the pins on tour that's pretty tight um, you see that um, at some clubs but you'll see a handful of holes you won't see every hole set up like that, unless it's something like a club championship. So that, you know, it certainly impacts it. And, and if Tiger were playing at a Muni and, and the flags were all, you know, eight or nine from the edge or more, um, yeah, he would, that, that number would improve. It would get better, but I'm going to play Reed devil's advocate to you, Chase, uh, and say, oh. if he, if they're so good, um, why can't they pick a target closer to the hole? So why are they aiming away from the hole if they're that good is kind of how I, I would couch that back to you. Uh, but yeah, would the numbers improve if they were, if he was playing a Muni at 100%, no question about it. But that still, in my opinion, doesn't alter um, what an amateur player should think is realistic for their game. Yes, the pins are a little bit easier, but the skill gap between Tiger Woods, um, Hal Sutton, and me is is a mo it's monumental. And so there's even though I'm playing easier pins, there's no way I should expect to play at the same level as a PGA Tour player. They're literally the best players on the planet, and it always baffles me how amateur players will come back with, "Well, I play an easier golf course, so my, my stats should be about the same as a tour player." Um, you know, I, I play, you know, occasionally I'll play a pickup basketball game and, and I'm, you know, playing against players that are, um, you know, not as good as NBA players, but I, I don't think I'm going to jump from the foul line and slam it down two handed like LeBron. I don't think I'm going to stop, start popping off threes like Steph Curry. I'm just not going to do that, right? They are the best players and, and why amateur players compare themselves to the best players in the world um, is always been interesting to me. I don't, I don't understand that part. So I want to weigh in on whether I think it would improve from three, three feet, I mean, three shots inside 10 feet if he played a Muni golf course. I think it would improve, but not significantly. And I think that's really important. It's not going to be seven out of 10. Sure, yeah, I agree. Uh, and yeah, totally. so just to put it into perspective, it will be four are maybe pushing five, but it's not going to be seven or eight out of 10. And I think the world is way out of perspective on how good they really are. I mean, I can tell you, having played the tour for 20 some odd years, that many great players have talked to themselves at night because it was so bad. <laughs> and that may come as a shock to everybody out there, but they're fragile they suffer from the same disappointments in the game that everybody else suffers from. They've just worked at it so hard that their best is good, really good. And, but they still struggle. And I think that's the most important part. The best players in the world have struggled at times. Yep. And I, you know, Lou, we love the LeBron analogy because we, we actually made it the last week or the week week before on the pod about why don't, if you're a pickup basketball player, why are you, why aren't you comparing yourself to LeBron? Because that's right. what you're doing with, with tour players. So I, I mean, I completely agree. Um, and then the other thing that, that I think is so important is, is again, the golf telecasts are highlights. They're showing the highlights of, of the good shots, right? So these are the best players in the world playing their best 
uh, and it's the best that week too. So, you know, we always like to say, go follow the guy that barely made the cut or go follow some of the guys that missed the cut. And you're going to see some very mediocre play. They're still playing on the hardest golf courses in the world, but you're going to see some, some mediocre shots. So completely agree. And if I, if I ever come off as two devil's advocate, I'm just trying to trying to get you to expand a little bit. I, we, we're completely on the same side as far as all this stuff goes. So oh, yeah, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't take it that way. It's uh, cool. yeah, I always enjoy the, the you know, the, the pushback. So you know, continue to push back, feel free. Awesome. All right. So stat number two, what, what, what's next? So we got the, um, so let's go with stat number two. And, you know, I, I, I do want to make one more comment ab about um, what we see on TV um, and Hal brought this up earlier. Anytime they cut to somebody that is not in the hunt, um, we know it's going to be an amazing shot. If they're on the putting green and they're 40 feet and they cut to somebody who's down in 14th place, they made the, they made the putt. Like they don't even have to show it. They made the putt. So we see a lot of really good shots when we're watching golf on TV and that definitely impacts us. So let, let's go to the next one. Let's do a, a short game shot. And this is one that uh, people always find surprising. Uh, so PGA Tour pros from 20 yards in the rough when they have at least 10 yards of green to work with. We, we know that not all 20 yard shots are created equal. If you're extremely short sighted, especially on tour, that's, uh, much more difficult than if you are 20 yards from the pin and you have 18 yards of green to work with. So let's take one. Uh, let's take only the shots where you're 20 yards from the hole and you have at least 10 yards of green to work with PGA tour players in that situation, they will leave 50% of their shots outside of eight feet. Um, and uh, I mean, I play with all the AMs I play with when, even when I'm 20 yards from the hole, sometimes I find myself, you know, hitting it to nine or 10 feet and thinking, ah, oh, you know, it's, it wasn't my best. I could have done better. Uh, and then I have to remind myself occasionally, no, that was, that was a pretty good shot. Uh, you know, tour player is going to leave half their shots outside of eight feet from this location. So that's uh, always one that I think is very useful for AMs, especially you know, uh, AMs like me that, you know, I don't hit 12 greens per round. I, I miss a fair number of greens. So I'm going to have a lot of shots that are like that. And it's important to understand what's good and what's bad. Lou, on that note, do you, you've seen, have you seen a big correlation between results from fairway and results from rough? Uh, uh, what do you mean by that? Across the board, like, do you think a very general statement would be to tell everybody at home that if you're in the rough, completely lower expectations and try and try and get this thing back out and play or try and get this thing to the to, you know, to the middle of the green don't don't compound another mistake. Oh, yeah. I mean, even, you know, on the tour, you see a, a pretty big gap between fairway and, and rough. And once you get into the rough. Um, for us amateur players, our, our job one is is just one, keeping it out of trouble. So if there's any kind of serious trouble, let's say you're on approach shot and there's water or out of bounds or anything that's penalty strokes or a bunker that's going to be extremely difficult, you know, we want to we want to take our shot pattern and move it far away from that because our shot pattern is going to get much bigger um, out of the rough than it is from the fairway. And, and, and all we're trying to do there is, is put it on the green, you know, hitting the green from the rough. I don't really care how far away you are is a uh, is job one for an amateur player, even for tour players for many distances hitting the green from the rough is is, is really all they're trying to do in a lot of situations, um, especially when they get you know outside of, of wedge distance the uh, the scoring changes significantly it, it's you know roughly a, a third of a shot, depending on the situation but it's. Um, you know, rough is let's just get it back in play and let's not make any penalty strokes. Absolutely. I was going to ask you on that note, if there was a yardage for a tour player that inside of that yardage in the rough, he got, uh, I know he's better out of the fairway than he is out of the rough, but you know, is there seven iron out their percentage goes way down in terms of efficiency or is it, outside a wedge which you said yeah used. yeah let's just look um so let's use 150 150 yards so a tour player from 150 yards in the fairway is going to hit the green about 76 percent of the time uh, their overall proximity would be uh, 25 feet uh, and they'll hit uh, 21 percent of their shots inside of 12 feet so that's from 150 in the fairway 
When we go to 150 in the rough, uh, they only hit the green 48% of the time. So they go from 76% hitting the green to 48% hitting green from 150. The average proximity is 44 feet and they only hit, let's see here, 12, they only hit uh, 7% of their shots inside of 12 feet from 150 in the rough. So it, it gets a lot tougher, uh, even for tour players being in the rough. And you know, you'll hear comments that uh, tour players are, you know, they're playing courses with um, you know, more challenging rough. And I think some weeks that's true. Um, there's certainly some courses that are are set up with you know three and a half inch plus rough and it can be pretty nasty to be in there. But um, there's a lot of weeks on the tour where the rough isn't that bad. It's relatively manageable. Um, and I would argue that there's a lot of, uh, you know, clubs that uh, we play at and courses we're playing at that they're really only cutting the rough twice a week in a lot of places. And, and so if you happen to, you know, play on the day, that's three days since the last cut of rough, you're, you're going to be playing in some, some decent rough at a lot of golf courses. So, um, I don't think the the notion that tour players are always playing four inch plus rough is is accurate. Um, and so that uh, when anyone brings that up, I, I'd like to point out that that's that's not the case. And we're often playing from rough that's pretty similar to what they play in the PGA Tour most weeks. So give us the stat from 100 yards in the fairway and, a, and 100 yards in the rough. Yeah, so 100 yards in the fairway, they hit the green 84% of the time, uh, roughly, and uh, the proximity is just over 18 feet, 18 feet, 5 inches. So we'll say 84%, and we'll call it just 18 feet. Uh, from 100 in the rough, it, that drops to 65%, um, and the proximity goes up to 30 feet. Um, so it's a it's a pretty big difference uh, for a tour player. Now, I, I obviously, and, and Hal, you'll probably tell us this when when you got yourself in the rough, you uh, probably get more conservative, and, and you're probably aiming much farther away from the edge of the green. Um, and, and so it's you have different targets from the fairway than you do from the rough. Um, and so you know those numbers would be very different if you didn't change your target and you were in the rough. So one of the reasons that um, the rough numbers are, are maybe better than they would be is because you you're likely getting more conservative. At least most players I think are. I would hundred percent agree with that, but the numbers you just gave us there, they're 20% better on green efficiency uh, from the fairway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they hit the ball a lot closer from the fairway. Um, and it's interesting. There's a, you know, tour players have a bigger gap between being in the fairway and being in the rough. And it's not because uh, the, the and, and I'm saying that compared to amateur players, and, and I don't believe it's because it, it's that much more challenging to play out of the rough for a tour player. I just think tour players are incredibly good from the fairway uh, and you the delta between amateur players being in the fairway and being in the rough is smaller and it's not because we play easier rough or because we're better from the rough it's because we're not as good from the fairway uh, is generally what what i see there uh, hopefully that makes sense the way i describe that how well how real quick don't so I, Lou, I completely get what you're saying. There, the difference between a guy, a, a tour player from the fairway to the rough is wider. And you're saying because of the fairway, my question is how, don't you think it has something to do with the fact that, you know, these golf courses are the greens are much firmer and faster during your play than they were, than they would be for an amateur to play it three or four weeks after three or four weeks before. Like my, my point is a hundred yards from the rough at, at um, let's say pebble in just a regular average round in june the ball is going to stop a lot quicker than if you're playing it in in at the at&t or you're playing it in the us open just because the, the 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 greens are so much firmer do you think there's any truth to that well yeah i think there is some truth to that but i think the reason why i mean tour players they understand percentages first of all and they pick different targets out of the rough. And the way they look at a hole, this is the way I looked at a hole, was I didn't look at it one specific time. I had to play it four days. So over the course of four days, what do I need to do to shoot the lowest four-day score on that hole? And I even broke it down even further in 
one particular round, I picked my target because I wanted to minimize how high I might go by picking the wrong target. And if, if that makes sense, uh, you know, a shot out of the rough, I'm not going to challenge a pin that's tucked with a deep bunker uh, because I can't be exact on how the ball's going to come out of the fairway. So I'm going to pick the target where I can be effective and not be exact with where it's coming down. Right. And I think all tour players are a whole lot like that because we're making a living doing it. And we got to, we got to cut the losses as soon as we can. And amateur golfers don't realize that as fast. They're not cutting the losses. And uh, would you agree with that, Lou? I agree. I agree completely. And you know, the, the biggest difference between when you look at, at skill levels, um, the, the biggest difference as the skill level improves is the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the big numbers. Um, tour players make very, very few big numbers. Scratch players, you know, make a little bit more, but they're not making a lot. You know, 15 handicaps make lots of doubles and triples, and, and they they get themselves into trouble situations. And, and rather than, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, just come to the come to grips with they're going to you know make bogeys a good score here like let's just try to make let's try to put a five on the card if we're on a par four there's so many amateur players that just compound their mistakes and and instead of giving themselves a reasonable chance to put five on the card or you know worst case six occasionally um they're putting sevens on the card in those situations so i i agree completely and you know all of the stats that that i see back that up completely um i recently went over and i'm now now part of arcos and, and i have access to 500 million shots so they have nearly half a billion shots from amateur players of every skill level and as i'm starting to peel back and look at the data you know, that's exactly what is going on is, is, is the, the worse the player, the, the more they are not limiting those mistakes and, and uh, they're just compounding for sure. So here's a stat that I'm curious about. I'm, I may <laughs> go off a little bit. I was always, I always felt like a guy that played the par threes on the tour. If he was really good at the par threes, shot real low on the par threes, he had a really good year. Is there any correlation to that? Um, you know, I've looked at that a, a little bit. And um, yes, I mean, if you're a good par three player, you're likely going to be a better better player overall. Um, and it, if you're averaging three on the par threes over the course of, uh, you know, a couple of years of being on the PGA Tour, you're going to be up near the top. You know, the, averaging under par is, is not very common. And I think like looking at career par three scoring, there was maybe one player and I, and I don't remember what the cutoff was. Maybe they had to play a hundred rounds or 150 rounds. And I think there was one player that was under par over that period of time with scoring average on par threes. And when you looked at the players that were right up near the top, you would see, you know, Tiger was at like 3.0 and 3.01. And all of the best players were right around three for a career scoring average on par, par three. So, uh, you know, making lots of threes in the threes, lots of fours on the fours, and then tearing up the par fives. If you're a tour player, you can, you can make a pretty good living out there doing that. Um, there's only a, a couple of players Again, I don't remember exactly what my cutoff was, but there was only a handful of players that had a career scoring average under four on the par fours, which is, you know, pretty pretty amazing when you uh, when you think about it. Uh, somebody like Tiger, um, pretty much threes on the threes, fours on the fours, and then just crush the par fives. Um, I wish I could do that for my own game, but it doesn't <laughs> doesn't quite work the same. Similar in concept, but definitely not similar in actual scores. Well, the reason why I brought that up was because we were talking about eliminating bigger scores and, you know, shoot threes on the card, fours on the card. They don't add up fast, right? Five, sixes and sevens add up real fast. And if an amateur golfer understands that and plays like that, accordingly, he's going to drop his handicap. If he is, you know, uh, a higher single digit handicap player, are above he's going to do that but he thinks what i've noticed is he thinks more birdies is going to do that for him that's not going to do that i think you can help them with that yeah yeah 100 and um uh the so a scratch player compared to an 18 handicap so let's keep this just in am terms for a second uh, a scratch player 
will make 1.8 more birdies per round on the average than an 18 handicap. So there's 18 shots of difference between them, but only 1.8 of those 18 shots is because they made more birdies. Right. The rest of it, it's it's all bogeys, doubles, and and worse for the higher handicap player. They're they're you know scratch players are not putting six birdies per round on the board. It's just not how it works. Tour players don't do that. Um, so the key to improving your game for nearly everyone is is reducing the big numbers, reducing the others, reducing the doubles, reducing the bogeys. The birdies will happen, and when you happen to roll a few in or you happen to hit a few close and, and make make some of those putts, you're going to have some good days. But trying to force that is not the key to better scoring for just about everyone, um, and tour players included. It's, it's limiting those mistakes. So here's something. Tiger's best year scoring average. Uh, do you know what year that was? Uh, I don't remember what year that was, but it was right around, it was like 67.9 or 68 point something, something around okay. the, that range. So what was his birdie average that year? Do you know? I I think um, the best he's ever done is maybe four and a half per round, 4.58 per round. Don't quote me on that. Like I'm, I'm guessing at some of these, but I, I think that's a, roughly about what it was. Well, that's um, what I thought it was. Yeah. Yep. People don't realize Here's the best player in the world at one point. I mean, the lowest scoring average, and he averaged 4.5 birdies per round. That's significant. You know, it's not six or seven. Did he have rounds where he had six to ten birdies? Yes, he did. Right. But he also had rounds that he only had two birdies, too. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, trying to force birdies and expect to make birdies um, uh, is not – a recipe for, you know, for good golf, um, uh, from the fairway, a scratch player from the fairway is going to average three strokes from, I believe it's 92 yards. So you put a scratch player in the fairway at 92 yards and they're going to average three shots to get in the hole. And I, I see so many players that are maybe around scratch or even, you know, up to mid index type players that, you know, get themselves 90 yards and, and they're you know thinking, you know, I'm going to, I need to get this up and down. And when they don't get it up and down for birdie, um, they, you know, they give themselves uh, a little bit of a hard time. And, you know, I think you, you know, with you, what you guys talk about with managing expectations is, is so important because I think having the wrong expectations can have such a negative, negative impact on a player. So when you are standing in the fairway at a hundred yards as an eight index. Um, and you're thinking, you know what, I, I, you know, I should never miss the green here. Uh, I should make a bunch of birdies from here. I should get this up and down a fair amount of the time. Um, and you hit a shot to 20 feet and you, you know, you, you're angry about it and you slam your club in the bag and you think you've hit a poor shot when you don't understand what good really is. Um, not only relative to your handicap level, but even to tour players, when you don't understand what good is, I think that there's a lot of players that end up giving themselves a hard time and thinking, you know, I'm just a horrible wedge player. And that mindset, I think, uh, ironically, has an impact on how good of a wedge player they are. Um, and, and so understanding what good means and what bad means, um, I think is really important to helping you play better golf, which is one of the reasons I, I'm always, you know, beating that horse to death on Twitter with helping people try to manage those expectations. No, you're right, Lou. It's huge because it causes too many people to panic, change yeah. directions, go go chase down rabbits down too many different holes, and then now they're lost. And so that's we we preach that all the time, all the time here. I love it. Um, talk about you mentioned par fives and scoring. Talk about I've written down driver every time, as driver as much as you can hit, and then talk about dog legs, chasing angles, trying to hit it in certain parts of parts of dog legs or or chasing angles for certain flags. Yeah, so um, let's start first with the, with the comment on driver. Um, I think the general rule for all players, PJ Tour players to 25 handicaps, is you want to advance the ball as far as you can. So that's important as far as you can, um, taking into account uh, penalty strokes and, and other potential hazards that you need to avoid. Uh, so for some players, that might mean driver 
almost every time. You, you need a reason to not hit driver for most players. But there's a lot of things to take into account. Um, there's a, a player that I was recently working with who's a mid-cap player, 12 handicap. And his dispersion with the driver is, it's not good. And if he were to hit driver all the time, he would find himself in a lot of trouble. And he does. He's making a significant number of penalty strokes every single round because he has a massive dispersion with his driver. He, he needs 90 yards of room if he's going to hit his driver and be comfortable that he's going to avoid penalty strokes. So if he's in a situation where, you know, it's a, a course in Florida and there's houses on both sides, he needs 90 yards of room between the OB stakes. If he has less than that, he is not optimizing his scoring by hitting driver. So my answer to always hitting driver is it's definitely player dependent, skill dependent, situation dependent, but you generally want to hit driver as much as you can, as often as you can, um, uh, you know, chasing angles. Um, so moving over to that one, um, that was something that it was the very first thing I did when I started to go public with, um, you know, golf analytics, I'd started a golf blog a few years ago and, um, really was just doing it to kill some time in the off season up here in the Northeast. And the very first thing that I put out was um, a, a study I did around angles on the PGA tour. And I had always heard, um, you know, if the pin is on the right, you know, you want to make sure to uh, try to aim it up the left to have a better angle to the pin because you're going to score better. And that's what I assumed I would see. And I didn't see that, you know, the scoring from, left side to right side um, when looking at PGA Tour data, there's really not much of a difference. And in some cases, scoring from the worst angle was, was better. And I don't know exactly why, but my, my thought, my notion on it is that we've always been told um, for years uh, growing up in the game, when you have the better angle, you can be more aggressive. Um, and when you have the worst angle, you, you can't be as aggressive. You have to go more towards the center of the green. And that really matters on the PGA Tour because pins are tucked so much. So when you look at players that have the better angle, they short side it more because their target is likely, I don't know for sure, I don't know what intention was, but when I look at the data, um, I assume that their target was shifted closer to the flag which means even the best players on the PGA Tour, they, they hit their shots into a decent sized bucket. And when you have a pin cut so close to the edge and you move your target closer to the edge, you're going to hit more shots um, short-sided, which is generally not good uh, for scoring. And so do they make a few more birdies? They do, but they offset that by making a few more bogeys because they're short-siding it. Now, when they have the bad angle, when you look at the data, they don't short side it as much. And that's probably because they're picking targets that are a little more conservative. Now, you know, I, I get as a golfer, when I stand up and I have, you know, a situation where I have a pretty good angle that sets up really well to my eye. It feels better. It looks better. Feels like I can take that pin on a little bit more. And when I get myself on the opposite side of a fairway like that, um, I also understand that I, I, you know, it doesn't feel as good. It doesn't look as good. And, and I'm probably shifting my target naturally more towards the center of the green. And so they don't make as many birdies, but they don't short side it as much, which is why the, the scoring is, overall pretty similar and what's interesting was in a lot of situations the best scoring was from the middle of the fairway and I think that that is probably because players are kind of finding that sweet spot when when they you know when they have the really good angle they might be a touch too aggressive when they have the bad angle they might be a touch too conservative but when they get in the middle of the fairway they might have you know just naturally kind of optimized um, the correct, I'll call it mathematical target, and, and which is why I think in many situations, the best scoring is happening from the middle of the fairway. I know that's a lot uh, that I just unloaded there, and, and hopefully that all kind of made sense. So, Lou, generally speaking, I always tell if I'm going out with a player, you can shorten the golf course by playing the inside of the dog leg because all the measurements on a golf course is measured through the middle of the fairway to the middle of the green. So 
you can shorten it if you play the inside of the dog leg. The biggest numbers are made by playing the inside of the dog leg. <laughs> so, I mean, am I am I right about that or am I wrong about that no. statistically? Well, so I would I would say for amateur players, um, I think, um, and even in some cases, professionals to to some extent. But I think um, you know, fairway percent for an amateur player is is generally meaningless. It's not something that I ever look at with any of the AMs that, that I work with that are not, I'll say elite. Um, so regular weekend hacks like me, um, keeping the ball in play is most important. So we just want to keep the ball in play. We want to eliminate penalty strokes. We want to try and eliminate getting ourselves into bad situations. And, you know, some bunkers are, are much more challenging than others off the fairway. So we want to, we want to, we want to keep the ball in play and eliminate penalty strokes. That's number one. I don't really care um, how many fairways you're hitting if you're, if you're keeping the ball in play. You know, do you, when I work with, um, you know, non-elite players, I just get them to kind of track the percentage of shots where they have a reasonable chance to hit a green in regulation after their tee shot. Um, and so if they end up in the rough and they have an open swing and, and um, I, don't, I don't want them to consider the quality of the lie. Sometimes you're going to get a great lie in the rough. Sometimes you're going to get an awful lie in the rough, but you know, do you have a reasonable chance to knock it on in the green from there? Um, and that's really what I'm focused on. So your point to, can you shorten the golf course a little bit? Yeah, sure you can. Uh, but by, you know, taking on the inside corner of the dog leg, I would be looking at, well, what happens on the inside part of that dog leg when I, when I miss to that side, when I have my big miss, are there penalty strokes in play? And if there's not, yeah, I mean, go for it. Fairways, in my opinion, for us AMs are completely overrated. So, you know, get it down there as close as you can, as often as you can, and, and avoid penalty strokes. Um, and that's really a, a good way to try and play the game. So I heard you say just then that fairways for amateurs is overrated. In my opinion, yeah, absolutely. You know, we just want to, you're going to, you know, if you pick good targets, um, you're, and you're keeping the ball in play, you know, fairways are going to kind of get in the way. It's, it's like birdies. You know, if you're, if you're, you know, occasionally hitting the green and, and you're, you know, picking good targets, uh, occasionally you're going to make some birdies. Well, occasionally you're going to hit some fairways. The things that kill the scorecard that kill around are, reloading and having to hit three from the tee or having to hit five from the tee. If you knock two in a row, OB, you know, keep the ball in play as an amateur. That's, that's job number one. So understanding your dispersion with the different clubs you would hit off the tee is important um, because not everybody's the same. It's, it's not a one size fits all approach. The uh, mid cap player that I mentioned a few minutes ago he is horrible with his driver. He's working on it with a coach right now, but him always hitting driver is a colossal disaster because he has such a huge area that he hits it into. And so for him, he has to, uh, in a lot of situations when he doesn't have a ton of room, he has to drop down to three wood or hybrid because he's keep keeping the ball in play. And I'd much rather you be 30 to 50 yards shorter on your tee shot and eliminate penalty strokes than being, um, you know, 50 yards closer to the hole with your driver, but hitting it out of play 15% of the time. Like that's not a recipe for good scores. So keep it in play as job one as an amateur player. Now the conversation starts to get a little bit different as you, uh, as you get better. So when we get up to your level, Hal, um, fairways are, are certainly more important, but keeping it in a window, like we want to avoid big misses. There's one stat that I, that I look at that I call the uh-oh percent for uh, tour players. And it's essentially what percentage of their tee shots are they hitting more than 30 yards from the center of the fairway? Um, and when you look at the players that have the biggest percent of those tee shots, those are players that are, you know, they are very likely not keeping their card. Um, and, and so as the skill level improves, we, you know, keeping, you know, hitting more in the fairway or, or less big misses, you know, those are kind of the, you know, the different sides of the same coin and in a nuanced way to think of it, it starts to become more important for sure. So let's, let's talk about this from an amateurs. You said the IO part uh, for a tour player. So at what handicap level does it become more important 
to, in your mind, for an amateur to hit the fairway? Is it a five handicap? Is it a 10 handicap? What is it? Well, um, I, I think you, when you start to get into low single digits, it, it starts to be more part of the conversation. But always part of the conversation is the, the big misses and eliminating those big misses. And, and that applies to uh, tour players, to, to 20 handicaps. If, if you were hitting tons of foul balls on the PGA Tour, you're probably not going to stay on the PGA Tour. It's, it's just that's not a it's not a way that you're going to score well. So we need to eliminate that. But the better you get, the, the, you know, the more important it is to to hit fairways, you can offset some of that with length and distance. Um, and it's, it's um, it really becomes an optimization problem. So, you know, Bryson may hit few less fairways than Brendan Todd, but Bryson's 45 yards ahead of Brendan Todd. So there's sort of this trade-off there that you have to balance and all of those pieces of the puzzle kind of contribute to the equation to, to figure out what's optimal. So here's a stat that you may or may not know about, but I guarantee it's factual. On the PGA Tour, if you barely miss the fairway, you're in worse shape than if you miss the fairway by 10 yards. Yeah, you know, I, I put that out many, many, uh, you know, probably two and a half years ago. And uh, one of the things that ShotLink tracks is um, how, when you miss the fairway, how much did you miss the edge of the fairway by? So it was really easy to, to look at that. And it was a significant difference. And I, and I think the first, maybe up to about seven yards, five to seven yards is where um, it was a lot tougher. And I have to assume it's because the fairway sprinklers are hitting that, that grass and it's making it thicker. And then once you get off of where the mainline sprinklers from the fairway are hitting, it, they, it's not as thick. I think it's, that's what's going on. It's that and the crowd. The crowd, yeah. Because the crowd is trampled down the rough. So the guys that punished the most were the guys that barely missed the fairway. Yeah, now, I mean, that, you, get sure. that, you get that one off shot where you really hit it real wild and you got a lot of trouble. That's the shot you've been talking about. <laughs> That's the uh, shot in my bag, Hal. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I got that shot. <laughs> well, we've all at one point in our life had that shot. Trust yeah. me. So, Lou, are you a proponent of, you know, you posted something about Dustin Johnson a couple of weeks ago about <laughs> one way misses. Are you a proponent of working it one way for your, your better players? I mean, do you get into, into that kind of strategy at all? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so I, I've tested this with a number of, um, of elite players that I've worked with, where I'll have them go through a, a dispersion mapping project with different clubs so we can understand how big of a window they're hitting the ball in. And we'll go through and we'll do uh, and we'll test um, stock shots. So whatever your stock shape is versus the opposite shape. And I haven't found anyone that is... Uh, better, uh, you know, work, you know, it's equal both ways. Um, I haven't found anyone that does that yet. There, some of them are really close, but I think most players, especially elite players, uh, they have a comfortable shape, which is, uh, I think, why, you know, when a, when a player steps up to a hole, um, there's certain holes that fit their eye, and I think a lot of reasons why certain holes fit a player's eye is the shape they hit the ball. Um, you have a player that, you know, a hard dog leg you know, right to left with trees kind of off the tee on the left-hand side and, you know, you you hit a big cut, um, that's probably not going to be that comfortable to you. Um, where uh, when you put a player like that on a, on a hole that's going to go dog like left to right, it probably lines up more to their eye. But, you know, I don't have good data on, on amateurs for that. But yesterday um, I posted something on Twitter and it's really good timing. Um, I posted something on Twitter asking for volunteers to go through uh, an exercise where they're going to hit 60 total tee shots for me, and they're going to hit 30 with their stock shape and 30 with their opposite shape. And the the number of players that have reached out so far has been uh, pretty amazing. I, I think when it's all said and done, I might have over 400 players that participate in this study, and um, I will finally have some really good data on amateur players. Um, I don't know exactly what to expect. Like I, maybe you know, 15 handicaps are, you know, maybe they're just equally poor in both directions, and it doesn't really matter for them. Um, but I, I can't wait to uh, 
to, to get all the numbers and get all the data on that. And it's definitely something that um, I will be putting out there in detail once I have everything uh, from all these AM, AM players. So that'll probably be another you know six weeks, eight weeks from now after everything trickles back in. What do you, uh, what do you guys think about that? You work with players every day, helping players get better. What, what, what are your thoughts based on what you see with the AMs you work with? So most of the AMs come in here and say, I, I am a decent iron player. I can't hit my driver at all. And, you know, most of them are slightly too steep coming over the top. They can, they can hit little pull fades with their irons and they slice their driver. For our better players, we tend to push them to hit one shot off the tee. You know, Hal talked about right. his best. He cut driver and drew irons a little bit. And that's kind of with the low spin ball and how they're all designed and high launch and low spin. We kind of like for him to, the better players to cut it a little bit unless they're just this natural drawer of the ball. But I don't, I personally think it's really hard to work driver both ways nowadays. I think you need to just kind of get up there and smash it just from your point. Like I hit it a long way and I'm cutting driver every time. And I'm trying to just, I want to, I want to find my next drive and have a, and have a chance to hit the green. Like that's the goal on every tee shot I hit unless I'm hitting iron off the tee or something like that. So I, I, you know, I wasn't near as accurate as how was and, you know, how could, could thread the needle a little bit more with driver. So I was always just trying to find it. Right. And, and that's kind of what our longer hitters, it's cut off the tee and do, do one thing. The shorter hitters, you know, can maybe move it around a little bit more, but not, I don't, I, I know we don't recommend it a ton. How your thoughts? Uh, I wanted to hit my start line. I didn't curve it a lot. So if I hit my start line, I was significantly better. You know, I mean, I, we'd sat around in the locker room, you know, and people would talk about, I, I couldn't see the line today. And to me, that always meant they couldn't hit their start line. You mm -hmm. could always see the line. You just can't hit your start line. And, uh, you know, to me, uh, we see that now club faces, everything, the ball's going to start where the club face is going basically. And, you know, in the old days, we used to think path had more to do with it than, uh, and we've evolved because of radars and everything else. But, um, you know, I figure out where your what your eye sees and then start it where, wherever you think your eye is going to hit the ball. Basically, you know, you're, you're, you're dreaming, your eye, your mind's eye sees the shot before you hit it. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Well, another thing I think nowadays with equipment, you can set up clubs to do what you want them to do. You know, you can set a driver up to be more fade. You can have it. I mean, obviously three woods always were a little draw bias, but today you can really manipulate that to where if you need a player to hit a cut off the tee with driver, that's fine. And if they need to draw it, that's their three wood club. And they've got, you know basically the same swing creates different different impact conditions or different you move the cg around on the club head and get the ball to curve certain ways so i don't i'm kind of with 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 scott on this i think you curve it you try to curve it one way you try to do it one way at least off the tee i mean how would you agree with that with with our better players not really trying to work it too much off the tee with driver yes i would agree with that you know one of the i mean scott and i've argued a little bit about this you know i don't believe if there's 60 yards of area out there it's always a driver you know i think even for the best players in the world sometimes they don't feel comfortable on a particular shot they don't see that shot mm -hmm. and if they're struggling with that you could hit a shot there that might be a life changer basically you might not be able to forget it it's at a bad time in your life it's on a hole that you may not ever be able to forget. You better go with your gut, not what mathematics says. Well, and, 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 on, uh, and on national television with a sh one shot lead, right? Like could ruin you. Yeah. I can think of numerous occasions where a guy hit a shot that he couldn't get over for the year. So how I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree that that is like going with your gut in that situation is not a math based decision. I think that it is. I, I think that um, club selection like that, I think it does change based on situation. When you are having a really bad day, um, your dispersion is much bigger, right? And your decisions need to be different. And when you're having a really good day, like I'm sure you had days where the ball just went exactly where you wanted it to go. And when you have those days, I think you can adjust your targets. So um, I, I, you, your gut is, is a math-based 
gut, in my opinion. And I think you do adjust targets based on the situation. And I do, you know, I use blackjack as an example, but I think that what you described there, Hal, is like playing blackjack if you're counting cards. So yes, we have standard rules to play blackjack and you're going to play those standard rules and, you're, and you play those standard rules because you're trying to optimize how much you're going to win. But if you were counting cards and, and counting cards is kind of like your gut that you just mentioned, Hal, when, when you're counting cards and the count is in your favor, you are going to bet a lot bigger to try to win more right. money. And so when the count's in your favor, that's like those days where the ball is just, you're hitting every start line and it's doing exactly what you want it to do. And when the count is not in your favor, you're going to bet a lot smaller and you're betting a lot smaller because you're less likely to win money in that situation. And those are those situations where you're having a really poor day. When you're having a really poor day, your dispersion gets a lot bigger. That Those are adjustments, in my opinion, that need to be made by players uh, accordingly. And, and it's hard to say in those situations what's exactly right and what's exactly wrong, but that's how I, I think of strategy. It's not one size fits all. So I love the way you worded that, Lou, because the truth is it is a mathematical equation that is constantly changing. Yes, absolutely. And and see, to, now I buy into the mathematics of that because it is an ever-changing thing. And that's easier for a guy that's playing every day with a lot based on every shot to be able to make that decision than a guy playing once a week. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he, he can't factor all that in. He's just not playing enough to be able to do it. Yeah, I, I think the, the the balancing act there is knowing and understanding how to potentially adjust. Like that's the balancing act there. And, and, and I don't, I wish I had a perfect equation that I could give to you to say, this is exactly how you should adjust in this situation. You know, that's player dependent. And some players are probably going to be better at making those adjustments than others. Um, and some players may, you know, may get too aggressive at times. Some players may be too conservative. Um, and figuring that out for you, I think, is, uh, is important, um, which is why I, I think, you know, tracking stats for a tour player, if I was a tour player or I was a caddy for a tour player, um, I, yes, I'm interested in shot link data. Yes, I'm interested in all that stuff. But for every single shot you hit, I would want to know what your intention was. Um, and I would want to gauge your performance relative to what your intention was. And then once we had enough data, we would be able to see what is happening happening to you in certain situations. And we would be able to get smarter on how your game is impacted by the situation that you're in. And that situation can be everything from where you are in the leaderboard to, you know, how strong is the wind and what's the wind direction at the moment. Um, and, and I think all of that needs to be taken into account. And, you know, I, I there was an article, um, I think last year, um, and it was about uh, Matthew Fitzpatrick, who's, who's kind of doing that. Like you'll see him, the article, you know, showed him and talked about how he is um, keeping track of his stats relative to what his intention was. And I think that is really important. And I think that's, you know, really, uh, eventually going to be really important for amateur players as well to, to better understand that. Well, I use that word intention a lot in here. What is your intention here? Because too many people hit shots with no intention, you know, uh, the fairway, you know, but it's more detailed than that. If you yeah. really want to be a good player. Yeah, for sure. I want to, you know, I wanted to go back, just rewind a little bit to talk about stock shapes. Um, and um, I did do a study with seven irons about a year and a half ago, and I had 207 players that participated and they hit a total of 150 shots. Um, and they, it was all seven irons and they did it over five days. It wasn't a marathon session. They did it over five days and they hit 50 shots with their stock seven iron. Um, and these were all kind of mixed in throughout each of the sessions. It wasn't, you know, just hit your stock seven iron 30 times in a row. It was, it was mixed in. So they hit three different types of shots with their seven iron. They hit a stock seven iron, whatever that happened to be. And then I wanted them to hit um, 50 shots, a half club shorter. So let's say you hit your seven iron 150 yards and you hit your eight iron 140 yards. I wanted you to try to hit your seven iron 145. So halfway between your seven and your eight. 
And then I wanted to do 50 shots where they hit their seven iron a half club harder. So again, you hit your seven iron 150, you hit your six 160. I wanted you to try to hit 155 yard shot. So whatever the gap was between your you know six, seven, and eight, I wanted you to go halfway between. One was your stock, one was half club harder, one was half club softer. And I thought for sure that half club softer uh, for amateur players, which is what most of the players in here were, they, they skewed towards the better side. They were, you know, scratch players at a couple like plus twos up to about 13 or 14s. So they definitely skewed on the better side of AM players. I thought for sure that the soft shot would be the tightest dispersion. And it wasn't. The stock shot was the tightest dispersion. Um, and so I use things like that and some of the other things I've done. And I'm of the opinion that you want to hit as many stock shots as you can, because that is likely going to be your tightest dispersion. And when you are you know, playing golf and you're hitting shots that are going to result in your tightest dispersion, you're more likely to score better. So I want as many stock shots as, as possible. So I can't wait to see the results of this driver test. I think it's going to you know, mimic what I saw uh, with the seven irons. Your stock shot is going to far and away be the best. Um, so I'm excited to see the output. So Lou, when you, how did you test this? Well, oh, first question on the, on the seven iron test, was it indoor or outdoor? I was indoor, um, indoor. indoor, and everyone had to have, you know, indoor and a launch monitor. Um, okay. A couple of guys did it outdoors. Okay. Um, and when they did it outdoors, they were on track, man, they normalized. Um, so, and then you were, know, you, it, were you testing dispersion, both left to right and, and yes, two? yeah. yeah. East, West, North, South. Um, okay. And uh, the, you know, the, the, the ellipse was tightest with stock shots. Um, and I was, it, what was interesting was the North, South was it was it was a tighter dispersion north south um, when you hit it hard and i'm not by no means a a, a swing guru in any right. way shape or form uh, i found that interesting and and i don't know if that makes sense to you or it doesn't make sense to you as somebody that you know teaches the game at a high level but uh, that was one of the other interesting takeaways is that it was a tighter north south when you when you had a a hard swing with your, with your seven yeah. iron it is interesting. I mean, we have a lot of people that come in and say they hit their seven iron X number and it, they very rarely do. And we tend to find that if they can smooth it out a little bit, slow it down a little bit, they'll hit it more solid more often. One of the things off of mats, it gets a little bit funky when it comes to that because you can go a little heavy and it knuckles and it goes further. So I wonder oh, yeah. if that might have skewed a little bit of the north south, but I, I do. I do agree that, you know, just the brain dead one, the stock shot's going to tend because a lot of these guys, you know, don't even hit little half shot or little knockdowns or, or they'll, they'll, most of them will swing too hard most of the time, but a lot of them don't, don't even try these shots that much. So that's where I, I completely, I could, I could see where your data came from as far as the stock shot being the, being the more accurate one. Yeah. You, and you bring up a really good point, um, about hitting off of, of mats. Um, you have to be careful when you're hitting off of mats. So I did another study from 110 yards and, and uh, had a lot of players in that one as well. And so scratch players, this was average dispersion. So scratch players hitting shots from 110 yards off of a mat, their, their average proximity was 17 feet or scratch players from a mat. Um, PGA Tour players, 110 yards from the fairway, their, their average proximity is 19 feet, 10 inches. Um, when you look at scratch players from the fairway actually playing golf, their average proximity is, is just about 28 feet. So they were 11 feet closer from mats than they are from the fairway because you're, you're right, mats are very forgiving. So if you are hitting a lot of shots off of a mat uh, and, you're, and you're looking at results, you, you need to need to understand that you are going to hit the ball better from a mat than you will from grass. Um, I think I would improve significantly if I got to take a portable mat around with me on the golf course and hit all my shots off of a mat. I would, I would drop multiple shots overnight because the forgiveness you get from pretty much every mat that you play. But don't you think too, like if, if we take, let's just say, let's just say how was PJ tour average from a hundred yards in 2001 okay so he was he was averaging from 100 yards in the fairway he was averaging 18 feet he was right at right at the average 
if you give him, and I think you got, you got into a debate about this. If you gave him 10 shots in here or 10 shots outside back to back to back to back to back shots over and over and over again, I would bet whatever I have that his average is going to be better than 18 feet. But if you, Oh yeah, for sure. I agree with that. Yeah. If you put him on a one-off situation to a back left pin on a slightly hanging lie, it's going to be closer to 18 feet. But if you give him 10 in a row, he's liable to make two or three of them because he's going to get dialed in and, 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 and be able to make slight little adjustments depending on the results. Oh yeah. I mean, in a, in a non-competitive situation, um, uh, I am going to go ahead and assume that your dispersion is going to be so much better in those situations. So yeah, I, I agree. Com- I agree completely on that. 100%. Especially what? if you're hitting off of a mat, you know, how yeah, might average, you especially. might average three feet from 110 yards off of a mat. Yeah, especially <laughs> off a mat. And we see that a lot in the combines too. Kids, kids getting a little routine with their wedges and they can put up some cool numbers. Um, yeah. What's one of the most in, impressive stat runs you've seen, whether it's I'll throw out tiger and I, you didn't have all the stats in 2000, but some of tiger's runs in 04, 05, 06, or even like, um, you know, some of the putting runs that Jordan Spieth went on. I mean, what have you, is there anything that we'll probably never see again? Well, you know, I want to, uh, before I answer that, because I'm going to pull something up here, uh, you know, Hal, you got to play side by side with Tiger for many, many years. Um, I, I'm curious, like, what was from you, from a tour player's perspective, I can look at the numbers all day and, and, you know, Tiger is just a treasure trove of, wow, I can't believe he did that. Like, you could just do that. You know, I could put a tweet out every day about that. But from a tour player perspective, like, what, what, what was really impressive to you? Like when you saw Tiger play, what was, what were you just wowed by? Well, I say, I tell this all the time. The difference between Jack Nicklaus and Tiger Woods is is Tiger did not fear where his next shot was going to be from. There were a couple of places that Jack probably, uh, I I think Jack was maybe one of the the greatest uh, managers of his golf game that there was. He knew his weakness was chipping and pitching the ball. So he played into his strengths and away from his weaknesses. You know, that's, uh, you know, Tigers uh, probably was less accurate than a lot of people with his driver, but that didn't cause him not to play his driver. And, uh, you know, he just didn't fear where he was going to hit the next shot. The thing that I noticed the most about playing with Tiger was he never, ever hit one the least bit heavy. His low point control was as good as anybody in the game by far. And, uh, you know, that's one thing that mats do for you is, is they uh, allow you to not have control of your low point, but still hit it halfway decent. When you get on grass and turf, you better be in control of your low point. And Tiger had as as good a low point control as anybody in the game. Yeah, um, I would. Uh, it's interesting to hear you say that. That's uh, that's really cool. Um, yeah, his. Uh, I imagine his low point control was was incredible for as as good of an iron player as he was. Uh, I wish I had that in my game, Hal. All right, so I got. Here's my favorite Tiger stat. I've, I've put this out a couple of times. So Tiger had a, a pretty good year in 2000, um, other than maybe the players. <laughs> um, he had a pretty good year in 2000. And that year, he gained uh, 0.62 strokes per round against the best 25 rounds. So that's not the top 25 players in, in strokes gain total for the event, or it's not the top 25 players in strokes gain total for the season. But if for every round that he played in, if you took the 25 lowest rounds from that day, he was gaining over six tenths of a shot on the best 25 rounds every single day, which is mind blowing. Like I I don't have it up, but I think second place that I looked at um, and I went back to 1983 with this, it was I think it was Greg Norman one of the years. And I want to say he was like. 0.19 0.19 or maybe 0.2. I mean, Tiger was so far ahead of second place in that stat, um, which is kind of a crazy, meaningless stat. But he was so far ahead; it was it was pretty incredible. And it, it just goes to show you, like, what an incredible year 2000 was. I wish we had shot level detail from that year. Uh, or the early part of Tiger's career. I wish Shot Link existed uh, back then because it would be 
uh, it would be pretty amazing to to look at some of the numbers he put up. I can't imagine how good they were, but that was one of the coolest Tiger stats that uh, that I've put out that I like. Hopefully that made sense. I know a strokes gain gets uh, sometimes uh, confusing to folks, but uh, that's, you know, as a math guy, that's one that I really liked. Any, uh, any interesting speed putting stats? Um, I don't have any uh, uh, on the, off the top of my head or anything in front of me. Um, he was a decent putter. Um, he's a really good putter. Um, and, but he's not, you know, he's not, you know, one of the, he's not, I don't think he's top five in the strokes gained era. Um, he's a great putter and, and he's definitely remember, one of the best i remember seeing something about him from like 30 to 40 feet or or 25 to 40 feet he may he went when when he was when he won all of his tournaments and i don't even remember what year it was 14 15 16 he it was the the stat was crazy how many putts he made the percentage of putts he made from those distances versus everybody else i didn't know if you'd you'd remembered or gone on gone and done any research on that no i'll ha i'll have to i'll have to look at that he's definitely a pretty pretty incredible putter uh best putter in the shot link era um is he might still be up there but it was uh like denny mccarthy was number one and and uh, faxon was number two um phenomenal putters the best putter from three to five feet in the shot link era uh is greg chalmers um so he was he had the best uh, you know average strokes gained per putt from from that distance in the show and you know the margins get really really tight so mathematically he's number one but it was by such a really really tiny margin but he was the best so um and tiger i think one of the things that made tiger great was how good of a putter he was phenomenal ball striker but he's top 20 putter in the shot link era and when you combine how well he hit the ball with how well he putted that's a pretty good recipe you know colin morikawa is a pretty good ball striker but nowhere near putting what tiger is and if morikawa putted like tiger morikawa would be a guy who could you know do some i mean he's a great player obviously but he could do some serious damage if he putted like tiger i mean 40 50 plus win type of damage you know 10 major type of he still might get there he's that good of a ball striker uh, but that is that is a, if he could close that gap and, and putt as well as Tiger did, he doesn't have to be number one. But if he could be a top 20 putter, you know, year in and year out, uh, he would he's going to win a whole lot of events. So here's a good way to close this out. I know you're running on a timeline here. Uh, I wish that the stuff that you know now had been available whenever I was a young man playing the tour because I would have known exactly what I needed to do in order to get better. So the young golfers that are out there today, there's so much stuff that can help them be better. There's so many people that can help them be better, but they have this, you know, inside them, they want to do it on their own. And I will tell you that the game is much bigger than anybody being able to do it on their own. Everyone needs help. Would you agree with that, Luke? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think you're right. There's so much available to players now. And, you know, I'm a, obviously a big, you know, stats and, and scoring and strategy person. But I think the, you know, the next biggest frontier um, for performance is on the mental side, sports neuroscience. And I think that's going to make such an impact with, with players. Uh, one of the junior players that I was working with, um, his father is a sports neuroscientist and, and I've, I've gotten to have a lot of conversations with him on this topic. And it, it's really opened my eyes up to, um, you know, how our mind is actually working and, and, you know, the how and the why of what's going on and, and techniques that we can apply to, to improve our performance. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the best players in the world are, extremely likely to be the best mental players in the world. I think there's a lot of physically talented golfers out there that are, are very good, but to be able to make it to the top, you need a, a world-class mental game. And, and they're understanding more about that every day. And I think that's the next thing that's going to move the needle in a big way, in, in my opinion. 100%. I would agree. Well, Lou, you've been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, everybody listening at home, check him out on Twitter at Lou Stagner. Also check him out on this Hack It Out podcast. Again, Lou, thank you so much. You've got a ton of knowledge and keep uh, keep spreading the good word on Twitter, even though uh, sometimes Twitter can be a uh, uh, an interesting place. So keep keep fighting the good fight.
Hey guys, it was great to be on. I appreciate you having me. And and Hal, I will forgive you for the players in 2000. <laughs> we can well, be friends Lord. now. We can be friends so, now. <laughs> I, I'm happy that I was able to beat Tiger in what you think is his greatest year. So yeah, uh, absolutely, that was his greatest year. And and you definitely you put a notch on the board that not many people can say they put a notch on the board. So well, it was the right time, the right place, and uh, um, anyway, right moment for me. Hey, thanks again, guys. It was awesome. Look forward to doing it again at some point. Yep. All right. Thank you thanks, we'll, we'll see you next time. Be the right club today. Yes!